Hello, everybody. I hope you're doing well. My name is Colin Robinson. I'm a senior in Timothy Dwight College here at Yale University, studying sociology and pursuing a certificate of advanced language in French. When I first started brainstorming the subject of my tour, I knew that I wanted to explore, to be frank, sex. For many of us, when we picture Victorian England, we often imagine a world of English prudeness and stringent sexual, moral, and legal codes. Sociologist Michel Foucault goes so far as to say in History of Sexuality that for the Victorians, libido played a limited part in the role of all classes, but especially the bourgeois, for whom there were only monotonous nights. It is a bold claim, but one that quickly breaks apart with mild reflection. How could it be, for example, that eroticism was prohibited, but families were typically large, with many couples raising five to six children? Take, for example, this piece within our collection of Reverend Palmer and his six young children. Set outside within the grandeur of their estate, we see obvious elements of their elevated bourgeois status, including the statue in the background of their garden, the multiple pet dogs, and their imposing house, still visible from the outskirts of the canvas. Already, Foucault's claim that libido played a limited role for the bourgeois is beginning to crumble. Nonetheless, as good art historians, further questioning is needed. So, how is it that promiscuous bathing flourished in Victorian England, but especially in seaside towns such as Margaret, where the Leeds Times reported in their September 2nd, 1854 edition, that despite the indecency of this mixed sex bathing oasis, the beach, and I quote, was thronged with admiring spectators, and many of them with glasses, although they were not required, as the bathers from the high tide were close to the shore. From just a brief reflection, it is clear that the so-called monotonous nights of Victorian England were anything but. Foucault is on much firmer, firmer ground in his insistence on the notion of repression, arguing that the policing of sexuality became an aspect of bourgeois taste and culture. As such, the bourgeois emphasis on propriety, decorum, and an authoritarian Christian morality invariably meant that sexual matters were rarely discussed in plain language outside the domain of the bedroom. Nonetheless, Foucault accepts and explains that sexuality was expressed via euphemism and code, enabling the discussion of sex to develop into a discourse of its own. Today in my tour, I will explore and analyze these very codes that enabled artists to depict sexuality from late 19th century Victorian England up to the early 20th century. However, I will be focusing on artworks depicting non-conforming sexualities, specifically homosexual male desire. For centuries, great art has privileged the male view of the female body, establishing heterosexuality as the norm. Yet beyond this male gaze, a queer gaze has also run in parallel, albeit, as we will see, in a coded or hidden form. By examining the works of artists, including Frederick Layton and Henry Scott Tuke, I will demonstrate that not only was queer desire and culture alive and thriving during this period, but that these artists' unconventional presentations of gender and sexuality pluralized the discourse of modernism in Britain. In art history, British modernism has often been overlooked by the focus on avant-garde movements like French Impressionism and Post-Impressionism. However, by critically engaging with the works of royal academicians like Frederick Layton and Henry St Scott Tuke, I argue that these artists grappled with modern anxieties and upheavals just as profoundly as their avant-garde counterparts. Their work went beyond simple visual beauty. They were exploring deep issues around human desire, the body, and what it means to enjoy life. These artists push us to see modernism in a broader light, beyond mere technical and formal experimentation. Together, in this tour, we will counter the dominant narrative of heteronormativity and examine the diversity of modernist expressions. Welcome to Reframed. Uncovering Queer Narratives in Late 19th Century and Early 20th Century Britain. 
Born December 3rd, 1830 in Scarborough, England, Frederick Layton is a renowned British painter and sculptor. He is celebrated for his historical, biblical, and classical subject matter, which he executed with meticulous attention to detail and a rich use of color. Beyond his artistic prowess, his influence extended well beyond the canvas and sculptor's studio. From 1878 until his death in 1896, he served as the president of the Royal Academy of Arts, advocating for the importance of art in society and the development of young artists. Leighton was also the first artist to be ennobled, receiving a barony in 1896, further highlighting the high regard in which he was held during his lifetime. It is interesting to note that such a bastion of the Royal Academy of Arts consistently created works emphasizing the beauty of the male body, as we see here in The Sluggard, made in 1895, without greater controversy in the public art sphere. The Sluggard captures a young man in the midst of a languid yet taunt stretch, with one hand clenched in a fist, showing a bicep and the other open and brushing the face, there is a balance of strength and delicacy in the figure. His head is turned sideways, captured in the moment of this release, surrendering his body to the unchecked supervision of the viewer. Though the figure, who art historians have identified as Italian model, Gaetano Vabona, is simply in a rather meaningless, quotidian act of stretching, that is to say, there seems to be no narrative context, there lies a sense of coquettish, sensual invitation in the piece. His large and tumescent pectoral muscles are proudly displayed. His sinuous neck, bare and elongated, bulges and strain. His thin legs and delicate pelvis pierce out of the pectoral plane, forcing us to admire. Drawing upon the rich context of the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood's exploration of gender and sexuality, into our reading of The Sluggard illuminates the subtle yet profound ways in which this work engages with and extends the ideological and aesthetic inquiries of its time. The pre-Raphaelites, navigating the constraints of an era that prohibited homosexuality, ingeniously probed the boundaries of gender identity. Artists like <clears throat> Dante Gabriel Rossetti crafted idolized figures that embodied a blend of masculine and feminine traits, challenging conventional representations of, of gender. This is vividly evident in Rossetti's depictions of Jane Morris in paintings such as Proserpine and Astarte Syriaca, where the fusion of pronounced jawlines with the emphasis of soft eyes and resplendent hair created a defining imagery of pre-Raphaelite womanhood. This exploration of androgynous physical types by the pre-Raphaelites, particular, particularly and their portrayal of idolized female figures was a radical departure from the norms of their time, subtly conveying complex messages about sexuality and gender fluidity. Leighton, encountering the PRB's ideas during his time in London and through associations such as the Hogarth Club, was undoubtedly influenced by the radical reimagining of beauty and gender. Indeed, in 1860, we can see Leighton begin to turn away from narrative history painting and consciously prioritize a form of aestheticism somewhat related to the work of the Pre-Raphaelites, though with a more conspicuous emphasis on classical, especially Hellenistic, motifs. We see this style come to play within these two pieces through the use of Hellenistic imagery, including the columns and vases, and the depiction of an undoubtedly Pre-Raphaelite-esque woman. The sluggard manifests this pre-Raphaelite influence through its nuanced depiction of the male form, which, rather than adhering to the muscular heroism typical of male nudes, embraces a more ethereal and effeminate presentation. It is essential to understand that, during this epoch, artists were able to circumnavigate charges of vulgarity or eroticism when depicting the heroic male nude, even when there was not an associative mythological or biblical narrative, since a muscular body was often seen as a sign of moral strength and heroism. So, how could a work such as The Sluggard, with its absence of a definitive uh, narrative context and depiction of a young man's ethereal physique, hide its queer undertones, only discreetly implying male sexual desire and gender inversion, 
at least to the public at this time. Moreover, why would it receive the adoration of acclaimed critics like Stephen Jones, who described the piece as, and I quote, a remarkably experimental work, naturalistic in treatment and yet still ideal in form? Fortunately, Jones' comment provides an ideal stepping stone into our inquiry. The naturalistic and treatment aspect that Jones so accurately perceives refers to Leighton's detailed and accurate depiction of the human body, capturing the subtleties of muscle, texture, and movement in a way that feels real and alive. This approach aligns with the aesthetic movement's focus on beauty and sensory experience, offering viewers a lifelike portrayal that draws them into the artwork. Simultaneously, the piece is, as shown states, still ideal in form, indicating that despite the naturalism, Leighton integrates idolized classical and Hellenistic elements into the figure's proportions and pose, such as the contrapposto pose seen here and in the statue of David. Contrapposto, contrapposto is an Italian term that describes a stance in sculpture where the figure's weight is shifted onto one leg, creating a sense of dy dynamism and relaxation simultaneously. This pose, emblematic of ancient Greek and Roman art, was revived in the neoclassicism era to embody the harmony, balance, and ideal beauty, ideal beauty of classical antiquity. As such, Leighton's stylistic amalgamation of neoclassicism and aestheticism not only provided the artist a means to experiment with form, it also provided him the capability of exploring such lascivious subject matter as male beauty through the protective guise of neoclassicism's sexless, pure beauty. Turning to Walter Patter's concept of diaphanete is particularly useful in understanding what is implied by a sexless beauty. Diaphanete refers to a concept of beauty that goes beyond traditional gender distinctions. Patter found examples of this in ancient Greek sculptures by Praxiteles, which beautifully blend youthful feminine qualities with masculine traits. These sculptures, according to Patter, embody a type of beauty that is not tied to a specific gender, but encompasses qualities of both, challenging the usual binary. Just as Patter admired ancient Greek sculptures for their fusion of youthful feminine qualities with masculine traits, Leighton's sculpture embodies a similar transcendence. The figure's sinuous thighs, delicate pelvis, and the subtle interplay of strength and softness challenge binary gender definitions and invite a more nuanced appreciation of human form. Therefore, imbued in the classical sexless diaphanete and incorporating the classical po statue pose of contrapposto, Neoclassicism allowed Leighton's the sluggard to escape charges of vulgarity, as it was a link to ideals of classical aestheticism. Although barely two feet in height, this sculpture, through its nuanced exploration of male beauty, plays a pivotal role in broadening the discourse of modernism in Britain. This contribution is deeply rooted in the modernist credo of art for art's sake, a philosophy born from the aesthetic movement, which, herald, which heralded art's independence from moral or historical imperatives. This principle championed artistic freedom, paving the way for a profound shift towards self-expression and the formal examination of painting, thus shaping the trajectory of artistic innovation into the 21st century. The sluggard captures this spirit of modernism with its unconventional presentation of gender and sexuality without a narrative context and its interesting mixture of neoclassical and aesthetic techniques, thereby challenging entrenched norms and advocating for the unrestricted expression of the artist. Through this lens, Frederick Layton's work not only interrogates societal norms around gender and sexuality, but also firmly positions itself within the evolving narrative of, of British modernism. It embodies the movement's push for an inclusive, diverse, and dynamic dialogue, contributing significantly to our broader understanding of modernism as a space for exploring the complexities of human identity and expression. Now, compared to the sluggard, portrait of Nicola Lucchiani, painted in 1913 by Henry Scott Took, is not as demandingly sensual. Nonetheless, the painting evokes a certain sense of intimacy that is hard to deny. The absence of a horizon within the piece 
establishes this sense of intimacy as it narrows our focus directly onto the model. The lack of details in the background and the model shirt highlight the intense intention to the subject. Tuke leaves us no chance to be distracted. Nicola envelops the canvas. He is the focus of the painting. The open brushwork in the piece further deepens this sense of intimacy, adding texture, movement, and vibrancy, and indicating a spontaneous, urgent need to capture the moment. This urgency is heightened by the use of the wet-on-wet -wet technique, which has allowed to, to blend colors on the canvas for smooth transitions and subtle gradations, and for the piece to be completed in one sitting, resulting in a fresh, spontaneous look. Together, these two techniques craft a radiant portrait, inviting us into this vivid world. From a distance, the brushstrokes merge into a cohesive image with vibrant depth, but up close, they reveal a complexity that draws us in, enhancing our viewing experience with its rich use of color and technique. The smooth color transitions augment the realism of this piece and the subject's soft features, adding an emotional resonance and an atmospheric depth. For example, the careful modulation of colors, such as the pinkish red and light brown of the model's skin, makes the figure lifelike and sensual with his rosy cheeks and lips. The ability to see these colors emerging through that sheer material of the shirt adds a further layer of vulnerability and delicacy, drawing us closer into an intimate understanding of Nicola's emotional state. The meticulous attention to light further adds to the painting's realism and beauty. The nuanced depiction of light on the model's face, particularly the redder right cheek, not only suggests the presence and angle of light, but imbues the portrait with a sense of time and place, making the moment feel both ephemeral and internal. With a forward but not direct gaze, open, sheer v-neck shirt and rosy pink lips, portrait of Nicola Lucchiani is beyond mere representation, but rather a celebration of intimacy and the sublime beauty found within the nuances of light and color. Now, Tuke's career was dedicated to capturing the intricacies of light and color. After his schooling at the Slade School of Fine Art in London in 1880, Tuke would travel Europe to study the works of Italian masters and attend a French atelier. In Florence, he would meet the artist Arthur Lemon, a fellow English painter who embraced the plein air, or outdoor painting, method. This approach allows artists to capture scenes in natural light, offering direct observation of the subject that includes the nuances of sunlight and shadow, the colors of the environment, and the atmospheric conditions of the moment. It emphasizes the importance of sensory experience and the artist's personal response to a landscape, making plein air painting a pivotal practice in the development of modern art. Following the idea of the Impressionists, Lemon encouraged him to consider the events of everyday life as suitable subjects and to paint by close observation rather than any classical or romantic mode, as we see here in his series of Italian sketches. He would take Tuc to Forte de Mami, where they spent a month painting the male nude outdoors by the coast. It was Tuc's first time painting the nude in this setting, and together with a style and an ideology of plein air and naturalism, would go on to define much of his work. Tuke's captivation with the adolescent male form might be seen as overtly homoerotic in today's world. However, in the late 1800s, it didn't necessarily imply such connotations. Scenes depicting bathers were broadly accepted, especially when they steered clear of sexual attributes and instead invoked the unblemished energy of a pastoral world. This imagery championed the era's burgeoning idea burgeoning public health ideals, as Tuke's radiant depictions of young men celebrated the virtues of outdoor and communal activities as a remedy for urban decay. Although Tuke knew his more natural depictions of nude male bathers were acceptable at the New English Art Club, which was the radical alternative to the Royal Academy, he knew he had to conform to convention when it came to nudes being accepted at the Academy. As such, for a time, Tuke tried to paint scenes based on classical stories and characters from literature and mythology. However, all gave him trouble. Hermes at the Pool was continually being repainted, and when it was shown at the Royal Academy, it was poorly received. Tuke, in fact, later destroyed it. 
Percy's Andromeda was also poorly received and would be his last attempt in trying to wrap his news within, within a mythological narrative. He seemed not to be particularly interested in the myths, and he found the attempt to turn his models into gods, and on occasion, goddesses, too problematical. During the 1890s, Tuke's style broadened. He felt able to render nude figures without reference to mythological or narrative themes, though some paintings, such as To the Morning Sun, seen here, retained some of the godlike qualities. To understand this sudden shift in style and depiction of the male form, it is essential to understand Tuke's relationship with the Uranians. In the late 1880s, Tuke was closely associated with the Uranians, a circle of poets and writers where the beauty of male youth was openly written about and discussed. In fact, it was Uranian member John Addington Simmons who, that would inspire Tuke to move away from mythological references. In 1893, he wrote to Tuke stating, I should say, you ought to develop studies in the nude without pretending to make them subject pictures. Your own inspiration is derived from nature's beauty. Classical and romantic mythologies are not your starting point. Influenced by the German sexologist and activist Carl Heinrich Ulrich, John Addington Simmons was a key figure in the defense and development of the Uranian's aesthetic ideology of male beauty. Simmons argued that homosexuality was a natural phenomenon, and as such, not deserving of the discrimination and hate at this time, nor in ours. In A Problem of Modern Ethics, he writes, are people sound in body, vigorous in mind, wholesome in habits, capable of generous affections, good servants of the state, trustworthy in all ordinary relations of life, to be condemned at law criminals because they cannot feel sexually as the majority feel, because they find some satisfaction for their inborn want in ways which the majority dislike. Simmons turned to the Greeks to strengthen his argument of natural homosexual desire. In his essay, The Idol Beauty in Greek Sculpture, Simmons contested that the aesthetic and moral genius of the Greeks was in their young athletic men. Simmons located this genius of the Greeks in contemporary Victorian society by looking at, and I quote, the water meadows where boys bathe in early morning, or the playgrounds of our public schools in the summer, or the banks of the Isis when the eights are on the water. As can be seen in this work of Tuke, the Iranian poets located in Tuke's painting not only powerful imagery of Simmons idea that homosexuality is natural, but also a direct link between the Newland School's naturalism and the naturalness of homoerotic desire. As a result, for the Ukraine, sorry, for the Iranians, Tuke provided identifiable imagery and texts that express these difficult desires to articulate, thereby making these feelings easier to understand, relate to, and accept as valid. However, this was not simply the Iranians projecting their desire upon Tuke's work. In a poem attributed to Tuke, his yearnings for the erotic freedom of Greece are confessed. He writes, Youth, beautiful and daring and divine, loved of the gods when yet the happy earth was joyful in its morning and new birth, when yet the very odors of the brine Love's cradle filled a sweetness all the shrine. Of Venus, ere these starveling times of dearth, of priest praised abstin abstinence made void of mirth, had given us water where we asked for wine. The poem vividly illustrates the belief that God or the divine is manifest in nature, celebrating youth as both beautiful and divine, and loved by the gods during a time when the earth was fresh, joyful, and newly born. The reference to the very odors of the brine as love's cradle and the allusion to Venus's shrine being filled with sweetness evoke a world where the divine and the natural are intertwined, suggesting that the essence of the divine can be found in the natural beauty of the world. This imagery directly supports the idea that the beauty of nature is itself an object of worship, resonating clearly with Uranian ideology. The poet's portrayal of youth as loved of the gods and this and the nostalgic longing for a time when earth was joyful in its morning and new birth, reflect a reverence for the purity and divinity of youth, seen as a manifestation of nature's and therefore divinity's most splendid forms. The mention of the starveling times of dearth, of priest-praised abstinence made void of mirth, 
critiques a society that has moved away from the celebration of natural and divine ple pleasures towards a more ascetic, joyless existence. This can be seen as a lament for the loss of a more connected, pantheistic relationship with nature and its beauties, including the beauty found in the male form and youth. By intertwining the adoration of youth with the divine and the natural world, Tuke's poem celebrates the beauty of youth not just as an aesthetic ideal, but as a divine embodiment, reinforcing the notion that homoeroticism is a natural inherent aspect of the human experience. By aligning the beauty and purity of youth with divine qualities, the poem advocates against the vilification of homoeroticism, arguing instead for its acceptance and reverence. This alignment serves as a powerful testament to the Uranian belief that the love and admiration of male beauty, rooted in the splendor of the natural and the divine, should be celebrated rather than condemned. Thus, the poem does more than just depict the beauty of youth. It stands as a call for understanding and acceptance, asserting that the expressions of homoeroticism are as natural and deserving of admiration as the beauty of the world that the divine itself has fashioned. Returning to the portrait of Nicola Lucchiani, we see Tuke masterfully employ the interplay of light and shadow to not only capture the intimate essence of his subject, but also to subtly advocate for the naturalization of homoeroticism. By portraying Lucchiani in such an intimate and reverential manner, Tuke challenges us to see beyond societal prejudices, to recognize the beauty and purity of the male form as a natural and divine creation. The painting, therefore, is not just a representation of a young man bathed in light. It is a statement, a declaration of the inherent nobility and sanctity of homoerotic desire, firmly rooted in the natural and the beautiful. In doing so, Tuke's art becomes a beacon of progressivism, lighting the way towards a future where love and desire are freed from the shackles of societal norms and prejudices, celebrated in all their forms as the true expressions of human nature and beauty. As an exponent of plein air naturalism, Tuke was a key contributor to the development of Impressionism in Britain, and both his radical technique and brilliant color established his reputation as a progressive, a painter who affiliated himself more with the French avant-garde and with alternative ex exhibiting organizations such as the New England New English Art Club than with the Conservative Royal Academy. Although sadly neglected for many years after his death, Tuke's importance as a distinguished British Impressionist with his own unique contribution to British art can no longer be ignored. A man of great professional integrity and determination, Tuke was both a conformist and a rebel. He knew how to make his style of art conform to establishment rules in order to get noticed. However, when he had been accepted, he disregarded the formalities and painted what and how he liked. Tuke's dual identity as both a conformist to gain acceptance and a rebel to pursue his artistic integrity highlights his significant role in the evolution of modernism. His willingness to break from the formalities and paint according to his vision contributed to the broader movement's push towards innovation and experimentation. Tuke's affiliation with the avant-garde and his pioneering efforts in plein air painting not only challenged the artistic norms of his time, but also paved the way for future generations of artists. As such, Henry Scott Tuke stands as a crucial figure in the narrative of British modernism, embodying the spirit of innovation that defines this movement. In conclusion, it's evident that the exploration into Victorian England and early 20th century Britain unveils a vibrant tapestry of sexual expression, artistic rebellion, and societal norms far removed from the stereotype of prudish repression. This journey through the works of Frederick Layton and Henry Scott Tuke challenges the traditional narratives of British modernism, illuminating the nuanced and coded expressions of queer desire that flourished during this period. By delving into the symbiotic relationship between art and sexuality, we have not only shed light on the historical significance of these artists within the broader scope of modernism, but also celebrated the rich diversity of human expression they captured. The subtle defiance embedded in their work contests the era's rigid moral constraints, revealing a profound engagement with contemporary debates on beauty, nature, and homoeroticism. Our exploration is more than mere academic inquiry, serving as a vibrant call to reevaluate the legacy of British modernism. 
It highlights the movement's intricate dialogue with themes of rebellion, innovation, and authenticity, urging a reconsideration of how art mirrors and challenges societal values. The artworks of Leighton and Tuke emerge not just as personal reflections, but as deliberate engagements with the socio-cultural fabric of their time, offering a compelling lens through which to view the complex interplay of art, identity, and desire. In essence, today, I hope to have made clear a more inclusive understanding of art history, one that acknowledges the diversity and fluidity of human sexuality and its impact on artistic expression. Before the end of this tour, I would like to acknowledge a foundational piece to the creation of this presentation. Painted Men in Britain by Associate Professor of Art History and Theory at Carnegie Mellon University, jean gu Jeremy Kim. <laughs> Sorry, by jean gu Jeremy Kim. His work was essential to my theoretical argument, and I highly recommend if you get a chance to read this remarkable work of art history. Well, I highly recommend if you get a chance to read this remarkable work of art history. <laughs> Thank you for your time and participation. I hope that you come to the YCBA upon a reopening and seize the opportunity to see the sluggard and portrait of Nicola Lucchiani in person. Hope you have a wonderful day. Bye.